Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Jeff Fitzgerald, news director and anchor at your hometown stations. And for the next half an hour, we're going to look back on the 30 plus years of the mayor's ride for David J. Berger. He is, uh, as of this airing, will be just days away from uh, becoming the former mayor of the city of Lima. So we're going to talk uh, 32 years of, of the uh, time in office for Mayor Berger. And uh, we could probably talk, David, for an hour and a half, but we, we've got 30 minutes to talk about 32 years. So welcome and thanks for joining me. Oh, good to be here. Thank you. I'm glad Great. you're spending Great some time invite. with us. No. Um, 32 years go fast? Um, yes and no. Um, reflecting on it, it, it doesn't seem like 32 years, but it's really been a, um, a rush of activities. Uh, and when I look back on all of that, it's, uh, it's been a lot, but it, I've been very grateful for the opportunity to, uh, to provide uh, community leadership on a sustained basis for eight terms. Right, eight terms, longest uh, serving mayor in the city's history. Um, let's, let's go back to, you've served 32 years, and I thought about it, you've actually served in five decades. A month of 1989, the 90s, the 2000s, 2010s, and then now in the 2020s. You've served five decades, albeit, albeit a month of 1989 or so. Right. Um, but let's go back to pre-1989. I've been at the station 37 years. You've been mayor 32. Uh, I covered a tad bit of the last of the uh, Moyer administration, then the four years of the Gene Joseph administration, and then you won your race in 1989, uh, beating Harry Moyer in a sort of attempted comeback. Uh, the the mayor, incumbent mayor, Gene Joseph, was primaried out, and uh, you beat Harry. Um, but before that, I met you standing out on Eureka Street mm -hmm. with Rehab Project and your right. corduroys and, you know, <laughs> more hair and <laughs> not as gray. Neither one of us were gray at that time. But I remember doing interviews with you, with Rehab Project. Tell me about the Marysville Reformatory for Women and busing in these women. Tell me about how you got started in Rehab Project and how it brought you to Lima. Well, I had uh, graduated with my master's uh, from Catholic University uh, and uh, moved to Lima in July of 77 uh, to take over a housing agency that was just established by an organization called Church People for Change and Reconciliation. And um, I was going to be here two years, uh, and then I was going to go back to school. I was, at that point, studying to be a Catholic priest. And uh, those two years, however, um, turned into 13 as I stayed and, and uh, worked on those housing issues. Uh, met a Lima girl who uh, kind of changed my mind about uh, uh, the course of things, and we uh, got married and had a family. Um, with respect to um, the reformatory, we actually started with inmates from, male inmates from Lima Correctional, um, and we had um, over 20 of them out every day doing, we were training them as carpenters and uh, having them involved in the renovation of housing. We wanted to do more, so I uh, uh, picked up the phone and I called um, the warden at the Ohio Reformatory for Women, and uh, we put together a transportation plan with a bus that went daily back and forth uh, and brought uh, 30 women here uh, every day, uh, again training them in doing uh, carpentry and renovation skills, and we focused them on the 100 block of East Eureka Street where we had bought up the entire block. And um, they did an outstanding job. It made national news um, and uh, really was a fascinating uh, community engagement. In fact, what we did here then got replicated in terms of the involvement of um, inmates in communities all across Ohio because eventually, I'm told, there were upwards of 1,000 inmates out doing community work uh, around that, uh, not necessarily doing housing renovation, but they were doing all kinds of community work all across the state. And uh, so that, that was a lot, uh, uh, great memories about all of that. I was going to touch on that, that we, we were not only doing local coverage of that, that the Rehab Project was getting national coverage. Right. National news organizations were coming in. And there in that process, the Dave Berger name became a little bit known. Uh, people started 
hearing about this organization and you running it. Take me to 87, 88, or give me the year. When did someone come to you, an individual, a group, and go behind closed doors and say, Dave, why don't you run for mayor? Yeah. Was that your decision or was, was, there, was there, how did that push begin? Well, I, I was in a situation where we were kind of butting heads with the city and that was frustrating. And so I had begun to look for uh, other opportunities. And there were a couple of national housing agencies that uh, uh, I had the potential of uh, jobs with. Uh, and that would have been the summer of 88. And uh, at that point, uh, there were some local business folks, some bankers and uh, others that approached me and said, hey, we'd like you to think about running for mayor. Um, Linda, of course, is uh, from Lima. Uh, she was the only one of her sibs that was still here, and her parents were still alive at that time. Uh, so we decided, okay, I'm going to run for mayor, and when I lose, mm -hmm. then we're going to go seek out these other jobs. Uh, well, you know, you got to be careful what you wish for, because sometimes you get it, and uh, uh, that started uh, then the process. I ultimately uh, faced, uh, I was in 15 elections over eight uh, terms. Uh, I'm the most contested public official uh, in the history of the city, not just the longest lived, but also I was challenged in all but one, uh, one uh, cycle in 2001 uh, when I was uh, only had uh, a general election. Otherwise, every time I had a primary election in addition to the general election. So it was... Um, you know, I, I always considered those um, elections as uh, job interviews with the public. They had the opportunity to, and I had the opportunity to engage with them. It was a vigorous process, and, uh, and we were successful. Yeah, you mentioned that with, when you're talking eight terms in 32 years, uh, Harry Moyer, Tom McNamara, Keith Cunningham, Ned Bouchong, Dan Beck, Doug Vermillion, Keith Cheney. Uh, so you had some staunch challengers and some the only one you like you mentioned is 01 2001 you were unopposed but uh so you, you had to you had to keep campaigning quite a bit mm -hmm. with the with the primaries and the uh, and the general elections but you win you win in 1989 as you said you may not have been expecting it but it happened you win in 89 let's take you to your first day on the job your first week on the job your first month on the job what was dave Berger? What was your plan? What was your goal? I, I just won this. I'm the mayor of Lima for the next four years. What, what did you look to accomplish? Well, um, stepping into the office that first day um, and diving into the budget process because the uh, budget had to be submitted by December 15th. And, you know, we discovered uh, that uh, uh, th the revenue picture for the city was not good at all. In fact, that, that was the beginning of a set of budgets for several years where we were just constantly cutting and we were in fiscal crisis most of the time. Um, but I then had to obviously uh, um, step up and begin putting together an administrative staff. First thing I did though was there were a couple people that I uh, did not hire, uh, but most of the the staff that was in place, I asked if they were interested in at least temporary appointments. Uh, they were, so then I kept um, most of the department heads in place and, and took out an ad in the paper, um, published all of the, those positions and said I was gonna take uh, resumes. So it took me, I think, uh, probably through August of that year to actually get all those decisions made and people in place. Uh, so uh, most of that year was spent just trying to get, get the, uh, uh, the team put together. Uh, and frankly, I mean, I just have had, if, if there's one, I think, talent that I've had in managing the city, it's been that I have had the ability to attract really good people and keep them uh, so that the administrative team has has really been in place in a very steady way 
uh, for um, the entire time I've been in office. And, and that's, that's been a real gift to me. It's been a gift to the community. I know all the years I covered the city beat, if you will, and I would, and that stopped about eight, nine years ago, but for 20 some, 25, 30 years, I'd come up to the office and I always, uh, to bother you, to, to, <laughs> to, to find something to talk about. Um, and it always uh, was a little more difficult when in the early years you had a secretary. The budget allowed for that. Things changed later years. Um, I'd have that, you'd have that buffer of the secretary, but when you didn't, I could get past Ron Hageman or Gene Cornwell or Catherine Garlock, whoever it may be, and I could get to you. So um, that, that was interesting. As you mentioned, you had good people around you with you at all times, and I rattled off some of your chiefs of staff and assistants, and, um, you know, but you were always, I was always able to get to you one way or another. Right. Most days you were all right with that. Some days I, I find it hard to imagine you didn't want to see me, but... Uh, <laughs> That's interesting. Now, your first issues, in the, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong out of order, I'm trying to think of coming out of the Joseph administration. Was that the hard water policy? If you wanted water, yeah, well, if water you wanted city water, you had to annex to the city. How did, how did that first hit, hit you in, in, in dealing with that? Well, I campaigned on the idea that I was willing to sell water. Um, and in fact, uh, we, we began to begin to negotiate uh, a variety of contracts with a variety of entities. Uh, that included the Allen Water District, that included Fort Shawnee. Um, we tried uh, for a couple of years to negotiate with Delphus and that never came together. Uh, but we've, we've dramatically increased the um, sale of water outside the city and uh, um, I think uh, to most people that's been a, a good thing. Um, it, it how, on the flip side, the back side, is that it did stimulate the development of a lot of new housing outside the city, uh, which then, frankly, contributed to hollowing out the city itself because we weren't able to grow geographically. So the, the, the decision to sell water um, has been beneficial financially for us uh, and for the water system, but um, it also contributed to folks who wanted new housing uh, to go where new housing was, which was outside the city. So it kind of complexed our problem in terms of the loss of population from the city, as well as contributed to uh, the deterioration of, of our neighborhoods. And I remember early on covering the Delphus water situation. Um, there was a couple years of negotiations to try to run a 12 or 16 inch line down 309 into Delphus to provide them water. And now, true or not true, you know, I heard the rumors, of course, there's still some hard feelings over losing the fair to the east side of Lima and the fairgrounds left, some of the old timers in Delphus, not happy about that. The rumors that if there was ever a drought, the first people that would be shut off is Delphus. All those rumors were flying. Yeah. But Delphus decided to go a different direction. They went with their own plant and their own reservoir and that just never happened. Right, that's right. So the other thing I'll just mention is that Right after I took office, I was sworn in on December the 5th of 89, and in January, two announce negative announcements took place, and it kind of became this seer it became kind of a symbol of what became announcements for another half dozen years, actually. Um, and that was we had then Secretary Dick Cheney um, announced the closure of the Lime Army tank plant, uh, and Amtrak announced that they were uh, going to move uh, the Broadway Limited and the Capital Limited. So we lost uh, train, uh, uh, passenger train service. And so I dove into both of those issues. And of course, throughout the entire, my entire tenure, I worked on issues relating to the tank plant. Uh, it's probably, when I look at one of the major successes that we've had has been our sustained partnership uh, through Task Force Lima to keep the tank plant open. Um, they went from having one year uh, no more than uh, $200,000 being spent on that facility to where they're now spending uh, nearly $100 million on upgrades at the facility and the equipment there. Uh, they went from being uh, producing uh, less than one tank a month to where they're now producing 30 tanks a month. And the forecast is that um, they've now got prototypes for 
uh, version 4 of the Abrams, version 5 of the Abrams. They're building the striker uh, structures and they're also scheduled to start building the uh, um, uh, the vehicle for missile launches as well. So the future of the actually the, the JSMC um, actually is dramatically improved and stable going forward. We of course did lose the uh, uh, the passenger rail, and I, I worked on that uh, in a variety of, of ways for high-speed uh, uh, rail as well as Hyperloop. Uh, with the uh, uh, infrastructure bill that just passed, I think there is now a, a major source of capital for the reestablishment of passenger rail, and I'm hoping that our community, uh, along with our partners along this corridor, will continue to work on reestablishing passenger rail. So. After we're both gone, there, there's, do you think there's still a possibility to see passenger rail, the, the Chicago to Pittsburgh I do. type thing? I, I do. I think that the, the, the Chicago to Fort Wayne, Lima, Columbus, Pittsburgh route is, is a route that has enormous potential. And uh, I think with having money now uh, on a substantial basis available to, uh, to that development, it's, it's a real possibility. Not leaving the, the Lima Army tank plant, the, now the JSMC. Yeah, you remember back during the Reagan military buildup years, there were 3,500, 3,800 employees out there. Right. It fell to, if I remember correctly, around 200 employees. Really, the below. lowest they got was 350. 350. And, but now it's back up near 1,000, if not more. So yeah. that has a lot of it sways on what administration's in office type thing, I know. But you guys have kept, as you said, kept it up. with. I go out to the task force Lima meetings on ways you make trips to D.C. We went with you a couple times right. and to meet with the, the leaders in, the, in Congress and military leaders to say, hey, this is a facility that's needed in Lima and needed in Ohio and needed for the nation. We not only lost most of that workforce at the tank plant during that what was called defense downsizing, mm -hmm. uh, but we also lost 1,800 jobs at Airfoil Textron where they made fan blades for Jet aircraft, Westinghouse, and we lost uh, Westinghouse, both the small motors facility as well as the um, uh, facility for the electric systems division, and uh, we ended up losing nearly 9,000 defense-related jobs, and that hurt. I mean that that whole that set of losses in the early 90s cost the the, the community 300 million dollars a year in wages and economic benefit. So when folks think about those years uh, as being difficult, they absolutely were. They were terrible years for us to be able to um, uh, manage and to uh, continue to try to turn things around. Um, and uh, it's, it's very much a contrast to where we are now. The last half dozen years, it's just been on this upward spiral and there's really good things going on right now. Yeah, we had to sustain, live through the Westinghouse, move to Sunstrand for a while, but yeah. that, that didn't sustain airfoil, Textron went. And yeah, I remember it was the, the, the industrial downsizing, defense downsizing was tough. Let's talk about the refinery. You have a long history there too. Yeah. The, the refinery has a long history in our community. Um, there was a time, I, I don't know what was going on behind the scenes, you would know, uh, the community shocked I don't know if caught off guard's the right word. The, the announcement, I think it was BP, yep. was going to close the refinery. Right. A historic refinery out there that had been there over 100 years at the time. And um, Tell me about what went on. One, how were you first brought into that situation? Who, who reached out to you and said, Mayor, they're talking about closing the refinery. What went on with the talks there to say how you found out and then jumping in to try and save it? Yep. We had a, I had a close working relationship with folks at the refinery for forever. That goes back to my days when I was with Rehab Project, and they were supportive of our efforts on a charitable basis, uh, providing us with, with uh, operating funds. So I knew many, many people there, and I maintained those relationships. And it would have been around um, the, uh, uh, around 95, when I was invited to um, uh, actually along with the mayor of Cleveland, Mike White at that time, and the mayor of Oregon, where 
BP has another facility in, near Toledo. And we, had, we were invited to a dinner in Cle downtown Cleveland to meet with the board of British Petroleum. And it was at that dinner when I'm talking to the head of, of uh, their global uh, operations when he announced to us that BP had decided to uh, basically prioritize which facilities they were going to shut down uh, globally. So I started inquiring after that. Where does Lima fit? And pretty soon it came back to me that um, uh, they had decided to um, sell it. And they were going to put it, they, they then made a, an announcement that they were going to step through a uh, RFP process where they were going to ask folks to come in and they eventually there was a fairly complex situation developed where there was a couple of internal BP folks that were willing to step out and potentially buy it themselves because it was a superior operating facility. And then it was in uh, November of 96 uh, when BP announced that they were going to discard the bids that they had gotten um, and instead they were going to shut the facility down in uh, the summer of 1998. And of course that's when uh, the community reacted, we put together a task force and we started what became an international confrontation with BP um, and, uh, and it looked like we were heading for closure and I think if, if it had closed the disaster that would have, would have been precipitated would have been not just the loss of the refinery, it would have because of their system integrations out there, um, it would have tripped the closure of most, if not all, of the rest of the chemical plants out there. We would have ended up very likely with a desert, 900 acre desert that would have been completely irrecoverable. Um, so eventually I, uh, in the, what would have been the winter of uh, 97, early 98, uh, I was able to find uh, somebody on Wall Street that connected me to David Stockman who was mm -hmm. the former OMB director under Reagan. He was then at uh, Blackstone. And uh, he had started a, an investment fund that was looking to invest in um, Rust Belt um, industries. And um, so I got in front of him and brought with me um, the former uh, plant manager uh, for both the Lima and uh, Toledo refineries. His name was Jim Schaefer. Jim knew the facility inside and out and uh, we basically were in a position to convince uh, David Stockman that this was worth his uh, consideration. And ultimately that led to a deal being made where the refinery was uh, uh, sold to uh, a uh, oil company that Blackstone uh, owned which was called Clark Manufacturing based in St. Louis and um, that led ultimately to the point where we went through about five different successor uh, companies before Husky bought uh, the refinery and Husky's investment has just been transformative. I mean, they bought it for billions of dollars and they have poured billions of dollars into its renewal and, and it really now is, uh, although it's the oldest operating uh, continuously operating refinery in the country at 100 and nearly 140 years old um, because of this latest investment it's now among the newest because it's been completely re renewed so um, that that's been a really important uh, uh, industrial asset and will be for the long term. Um, we're quickly running out of time that's how fast a half an hour goes but and that's, that's a success story. Uh, the struggles with global, we're gonna, you, you worked on that for years, but again, we're running out of time. It just didn't work out there at the former locomotive works. Yeah, the global energy we worked on for about 18 years. Uh, they poured about $40 million into uh, the project development and then uh, it went bankrupt. So that was a disappointment. Yeah. And I still think it's, uh, it, it's a, one of those things that had it worked, would have been a, a transformative investment in our community. 
Let's talk real quick, as, as I said, we're running out of time, but the downtown. Um, I've been here all my life, and I remember Greg's and Leader, and I've seen full circle downtown, but the revitalization we're going through now with the, the Borash Center, Road State, uh, restaurants and shops, and the Lima Rotary, Greater Lima Region Amphitheater. Touch on the, what you're seeing, the downtown, as it revitalizes. Yeah, it's really a wonderful thing uh, when you look at the investments that have been made over time, everything from the new Y, uh, new in my mind, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the hotel, the parking garage, those, those were early uh, half of, of my time in office. Uh, but now, uh, with these new investments uh, that include, as you said, the, the Road State College uh, investment in the Bora Center, uh, the uh, uh, renovation and reuse of the uh, a former Huntington Bank building, First National Bank building as housing, uh, restaurants downtown that people are really enjoying, uh, and, and then we've got um, market rate housing being developed downtown with a number of developers that are doing some really incredible things. The, um, you know, uh, Stephen Bryan uh, Walters and their dad um, have, uh, when you look at how they're, they're transforming the old Met Bank building into housing and the price point on, on those, uh, they are gorgeous units and, and we're seeing some other developers also step up. So we're positioned well. There's huge momentum building and I think that uh, uh, we'll, uh, it's, it's going to be uh, a wonderful time to see these things all come together. Again. Fast running out of time. I want to touch on when you got into the business of being a politician and I got into the TV business, say, I think we both knew that, I learned quickly anyway, you can't make everyone happy. It's just, it's an impossible feat to make everyone happy. Um, I'll take my hits, you'll take your hits. But talk to me about uh, family sacrifice. Linda, uh, I know these probably last couple terms, you guys probably had in-depth discussions about what are the, what are the run, um, the loss of Monica. Um, how hard? How hard is it on your family to to live the life that you were? Yeah. Um, well, we had a, an, an issue at one point when my son had a party at our house. Mm -hmm. You may remember, uh, and uh, I had always told the kids, you know, you're going to be more embarrassed than I am. Uh, and he got busted, uh, and it became front page for about six months. It was prosecuted. Um, and that was difficult. Um, so yeah, there's, there is a sacrifice uh, that, uh, that the family bears. Plus, you know, I worked 60 hours a week all the time. Uh, so there were, um, you know, what are often holidays for everybody else were work days for me. Um, and, um, uh, but, you know, we, we've, we have a really fine family and six grandkids now. Uh, and, uh, and they're all doing well, so we're looking forward to uh, how we can uh, engage with them and, uh, you know, do yeah. well. Well, I don't know what the next chapter in your life holds. I, I'm not sure if you know or you're willing to tell, but I'm assuming you'll spend some family time and travel time and do the normal things until yeah. you get your next job. <laughs> we have, we, uh, you know, Michael's in Seattle, uh, Jenny's in L.A., Carmi's in Southern Ohio. Um, so yeah, we'll, we expect to uh, be visiting them more regularly than we've been able to. And I am looking for work, and it won't be in anything that I've been doing. Looking to uh, learn some new things and see what else is out there. David, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for the 32 years of service to the Lima community. Thanks for sitting down and talking with us a little bit. Uh, best of luck in that next chapter of your life. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it, Jack. And thank you for joining us. Uh, Mayor David Berger wrapping up 32 years and eight terms in office. Uh, we appreciate his time and always being uh, open to talking with us. And we appreciate it and uh, thank you for joining us. <laughs>